All right, so we'll get started and to introduce our presenters, um, Mr. Samuel Roberts. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. All right. So I'm excited to introduce the next two people. I spend a lot of time working with them, and uh, some parts of the year are uh, more than other parts. But uh, Lauren, I, I work with her all the time, every day, almost. Uh, but uh, Jinx Watson is a member of our book selection committee, and she has uh, been with the committee since the very beginning. 2001 when the committee was formed after the program was open for replication. So she is very, very familiar with our book selection process. Um, she's a retired associate professor of information sciences at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And uh, I work with, uh, in addition to just the book selection process, um, I consult with her a lot on various, uh, various things, including the reading test, and I work on those as they come out for the new program the next program year. Also work with her on the translation of the bilingual titles um, to consult on that. Um, most of those titles are uh, translated specifically for our program. Uh, so the Penguin works with us uh, to, develop, to, develop, to develop those as well. Um, so that's Jinx Watson. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Lauren as well. He's going to follow up Jinx. Um, and Lauren works with Penguin Random House, who has been the publisher for the Imagination Library program since we moved from Golden Books to uh, to to uh, Penguin Random House, which was 2001 as well, uh, thought it was interesting earlier when Jinx and I were talking about that. Um, just a side note: we can kind of come full circle with Little Golden Books because uh, in August we're mailing out a Little Golden Book uh, because <laughs> Penguin merged with Random House, who owns Little Golden the, the property of Little Golden Books. So, little hit bit there. So Lauren works with Penguin again. Uh, she oversees everything from the selection, planning, to uh, I work with her on the projections, the paper orders to print the books, uh, getting the books uh, produced in Asia and shipped over. Uh, work with every month I submit a book order to her uh, for all the, uh, all the books in the U.S. Uh, so she's very heavily involved in the day-to-day -day operation of our relationship between the Imagination Library and Penguin. So it's Lauren D. Simone. Uh, Jinx is going to start off this morning, or this afternoon. <laughs> so I'm going to pass it over to her. Uh, this is uh, Jinx Watson. Okay, I know my grandchildren are here, but are these, are these former students? Uh, you know, like, who's here? Okay. okay. Um, thank you. This is wonderful to be in the last session of the day. If you close your eyes for a little snooze, power nap, whatever, I'll understand. Um, I sort of, sort of structured my comments in three parts. Uh, and the first part is like talking to the choir. Why am I telling you how powerful language and storytelling and reading and early literacy is? But I thought, and I heard Teresa talking before about your elevator speech. Uh, some of these images or words that I'm going to share with you, examples, may be helpful in that elevator speech as you talk to others and get your own speeches about imagination library. Um, the second part of the talk is really shedding some light on the selection process. As uh, five or six of us sit around and get locked up in a room for two and a half days, <laughs> bring, they bring us food. They don't even trust us to go out because we might not come back. We don't know why they do that. But, uh, it is a serious business. I want to just talk about kind of the ideas that we sort out, uh, fight over, compromise, uh, and um, finally culminate in making each year's selection. The last is to do something new. And you have in front of you uh, a sn The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats. We're going to look at what I call an almost perfect picture book. And I want to share my insights into what makes that a seamless book. So that will be at the end. So just wait for that, and we'll send you on your way. If we haven't thought about it, it is really a no-brainer. It all begins with stories and telling tales. We actually create and share and change our world with and through language. Language helps us make meaning of our own life's experience. 
new simple words, complex words. The complex words we typically don't use in our oral speech. We find <laughs> complex words in our literary language. And you can find them in pictures, and I'll show several examples today. Basically, language is powerful. And babies know that. Babies begin right from birth, trying to communicate, making audible sounds. Before three months old, they recognize a parent's voice. And they turn their heads as they hear the dad's voice, especially because it's lower and the timber is something that they can um, hear. Uh, surrounded by books, children before one anticipate the pleasure of words, fun, of great sounds, of rhyming, of sitting in someone's lap, of the anticipation of books and storytelling is powerful and it's quite visible on children from zero to 12 months. Babies in the crib experiment with sound patterns, they do rhyming, onomatopoeia, wordplay, nonsense words. They're making sense of their world around them from the sounds that they've already heard and from sounds that their tongues and their voices can make already. So we know that children feel like they're communicating. They soothe themselves. It's one self-soother at night for babies in the crib to sing to themselves or put themselves to sleep that way. And also to be in relationship specifically with their parents or caretakers. As adults, we often forget that one way to learn is trying on or practicing privately. Um, we practice sounds as babies ourselves growing up. Current research now suggests that we should mimic the sounds that babies are making. That it tells them that they have made sense. So if they're in the crib going ba 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 ba, we say back to them ba 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 ba. And if you look at their faces, there is a sense of recognition or a smile that comes on. So it is letting them know, yes, their words have been received and we're in relationship here as we play this game of making nonsense sounds back and forth. We all gave ourselves and still do private lessons in telling stories after hearing good ones or singing songs in our head or out loud after we hear a really good one. This is what children do. They'll hear some words, they'll try them on and practice them and um, they're not only mimicking so that they can be in the world with us, but they are striving to communicate. I say fill the air for babies and toddlers with songs and stories, with classic nursery rhymes, and with repetitions of sounds and words and phrases. Those of you who are English speakers will recognize this classic beat. Jack or Jill or up or down, bench or tail or water. That's called iambic pentameter. Many of us from junior year in English class, <laughs> that didn't make sense at all. If they started with nursery rhymes, we would have been like, oh yeah, I got that. It's a regular beat. It's soothing, it's strong, it's weak, it's strong, it's weak, it's strong. And I can't think of anything more powerful than to have a baby in your lap and doing those nursery rhymes. There's not enough grandma sitting in rocking chairs in the kitchen anymore um, teaching the kids the nursery rhymes. If we don't do it between zero and five, there's a whole opportunity that's lost for children uh, as they begin to store a bank of sounds and images, but mostly rhyme and rhythm. You all know that you could sit a child in your lap and read the Wall Street Journal, and it would be just as loving and fine as that child. They want to hear your voice. They want to hear words. They want to feel like they're in relationship with literacy and with the caretaker parent. The author of um, the Ladybug, uh, Ladybug Girl book say, we use words to create worlds. And sooner or later, these nonsense words to a child, or the Wall Street Journal words to a child, begin to shed light, to begin to make sense. And a child can point to the cat and say, cat, or dog, or dog, or dad. And um, they begin to connect. Mostly I want to talk in the next couple of frames here about the payoffs or the gifts of babies being with books. 
is certainly like to be held. There's an intimacy and physical contact that we may not offer any time during the day in our busy world than when we're curled up to share a book with a child. That's extremely special. We know this from psychology experiments with monkeys from the 1940s, but that shared feeling of body against body, of curling up, and then having that extra bonus of a book there, uh, is the most powerful parent-child experience. Books call for this sense of intimacy. It's called lap reading. In terms of payoff or gifts, it's a gift of time. In our busy days, again, this is time away from electronic devices, mm -hmm. away from work, away from the, you fill it in, the news, away from other siblings, away from cooking a meal, away from, away from. This is special time that you've invested now for the next 10 minutes in your child. And that child knows that that is a gift. There is no better one. Overheard at a uh, Toys R Us store, one parent says to one cashier line, I do not know what else to get my child for his birthday. She's laden with toys. <laughs> and the second parent goes, what about a book? And the first parent says, if I get a book, I'll have to read it to him. And I don't have the time to do that. Aww. That's a lot of time. It's an investment. It means i got to stop everything that I'm doing that makes me feel important and, you know, in a panic and a rush and trying to get things done on my list. I've got to sit down, curl up, read this book, and maybe talk to them. And this, this mama didn't have time. She hadn't been told about it. But this is not just a singular incident. This is major in our culture. I don't think people have that realization. As an aside, I'll tell you that I'm fairly passionate about this chunk of slides that I'm telling you about. Because this summer I decided to spend every Monday at 10 o'clock, Wednesday in the morning, and Friday, working with a group of seven kids from the Girls Club in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. They had asked me if I would help tutor them. That whole idea of drill and practice just does not make sense to me. And I said if I can read aloud to the children and have an experience around these books that I've selected for seven and eight-year-old girls, I said I would rather do that. Oh, go do it, do it, do it. Well, I'm in session three, and these children have never been read to. They are so wiggly. They are, I mean, they are high interest books. There should be no problem. I can, my most recent foray with this was that I got through two and a half chapters. But these are fairly short chapters. They are just not attentive. They're not, their, skill, their reading skills are low, their listening skills are low, and I'm saying they missed out zero to five with all these gifts of time, of intimacy, of wordplay. And now to catch up at age seven and eight, it's almost too late. But I'm so determined. I really want to see some uh, you know, legacy at the end of this summer. <laughs> What's a payoff or a gift? It's the fun, just with each other. I wish I could still roller skate with my grandkids. I did for a while, then fell back on my head. No, I'll not do that either. <laughs> I wish I could go on a zip line with them, but no, I'm just not gonna do that anymore. Uh, but I do know that I love stories, and that's a bond, that's a shared activity that an old grandma can do with a very young kid. And uh, it's a mutual activity where we both laugh out loud or get very serious as we consider the consequences of whatever is happening in the world. We may be quiet and intense, or we may be hysterical. Slap our thighs as one more antic comes out of it. <coughs> What's the payoff for the baby? Baby. Whoops. <coughs> Book person. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. okay. Thank you. So, kindergarten teachers are the first people to tell us how much this program works in this state. Because those five year olds, as they come in to kindergarten, some of them sort of look around and try to find the button to make it work. Wrong. 
buttons don't make folks work. Some children sort of look upside down, turn it around, cannot quite figure out how to open the book. Children who have had the Imagination Library know how a book works. And they know how new worlds are really hiding in those pages. And that's really what they're waiting for. At the end of several months of being read to, children begin now seeing um, words in their environment. They are seeing signs and TV ads, names of cereal and drinks and fast food, the great giant M for McDonald's is one of the first ones, and you link it to the child's name Mary, and you begin that whole beautiful process of showing that sound symbol relationship. It's too late at five and six. All of that work is called pre-reading, and it's happening between zero and five. Reading, I think children know, is powerful, and they see it's significant, worlds. Um, learning to read really starts with the big picture. We need to be reading, 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 and then we get to refine our reading skills ourselves and begin that sound symbol relationship and can learn the act of decoding, which is getting the word off the page and becoming readers. But it has to start with big book reading and stories. If you just start with drill and practice at age five or six, what's the sense? What's the meaning? There's no payoff. A child doesn't have that capacity for understanding that it's going to unlock a book or a story or a book. I think the more I've thought about these issues is that we have two kinds of language. We have talking language. We have vernacular, dialect. How are you doing? Fine. What did you do in school today? Nothing much. We talk in partial sentences. But good literature, and we have wonderfully good literature from zero to five, as you've seen in the books that we pick, has literary language. And in literary language, the syntax or grammar is actually different from the way we talk. It's the best of the English language. And I'm going to just share some examples because I really feel like this is the most, one of the more powerful pieces uh, of an argument. In Peter Rabbit, for example, the three sparrows implored Peter to exert himself. I mean, this was written 120 years ago. Implored is not a word really in American vocabulary. It seems a little bit. But a child hears that word. He understands the meaning just from context and then may try it out. For example, in the second example of Beatrix Potter, the Flopsy Bunnies eat a bunch of lettuce. And they use a word that I'd never heard of until I was this first grade teacher. The little rabbits smiled sweetly in their sleep under the shower of grass. They did not awake because the lettuces had been so soporific. <laughs> Soporific. I did not stop to define it because I did not really know what that word was as I was reading this aloud to first graders. But I have to tell you that within 15 minutes, I had one or two little students come up to me and they said, Miss Watson, I don't think we can do our work this afternoon. We're feeling a little soporific. <laughs> and I laughed, and I laughed, and I will never forget that. <laughs> so new language, vocabulary. And then try this for mode of, of reading. In Brother Eagle, Sister Sky, it is the speech that Chief Seattle gave to the U.S. government. And these are his words. And these are the words that we can read aloud to the children in our laps. How can you buy the sky, Chief Seattle began. How can you own the rain and the wind? My mother told me every part of this earth is sacred to our people every pine needle, every sandy shore, every mist in the dark woods, every meadow and humming insect, all are holy in the memory of our people. And Susan Jefferson's done a wonderful job of putting this together in a picture book with wonderful text and, and glorious illustrations. You will hear from Matt de la Pena tomorrow. And I'm gonna ask him if he was conscious as he figured out how to play with three modes of talk in his book, Last Stop on Market Street. 
What he has done here is amazing and beyond belief. He's got the vernacular or dialect of a grandmother. He's got the dialect of a small child, a <coughs> grandchild. And then he has his own poetic, lyrical voice as a commentary. So he's really weaving in three styles of language in here. Here goes his talk. From the bus stop, he watched water pool on flower petals, watched rain patter against the windshield of a nearby car. His friend Kobe climbed in, gave CJ a wave, and drove off with his dad. Now listen to the child's voice. Nana, how come we don't got a car? Grandmother is constantly pointing out the beauty in their world as they take the bus from church down to the soup kitchen. Boy, what do we need a car for? We got a bus that breathes fire, and old Mr. Dennis, who always has a trick for you. That's her voice. And then back to Matt de la Pena's voice. The bus creaked to a stop in front of them. It sighed and sagged, and the door swung open. That's literary language. That's not vernacular. That's not dialects. So we have these three different styles of language in this book. In a 32-page picture book, it's introducing children to new words, new concepts, new metaphors, new pictures in the way that he has selected his very lovely language, poetic. My last example on the power of the syntax and word choice is a Canadian book. Any Canadians here today? Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be showing up in your library. Uh, it's a hockey book, which is the national passion. And it's called When the Moon Comes. As we took turns to read the books to each other this last May, this, this book just caught me with uh, just delight. On this page, first of all, this is a marvelous graphic of the moon phases from waning to or from waxing to waning. It is so beautiful. It is like all the moons in 30 days stacked here so that you can really see that process of it becoming smaller and larger. And here's the text that goes with it. This week, the moon is growing. Friday, while we sleep, the snow comes half a foot when we wake up on Saturday, and it does not stop. Children are waiting for it to be so cold that it not only snows, but make that clear black ice in their hockey ponds in the backyard. It is dark, dark now, and the face of the sky is freckled with stars. But on the far side of the flood, the sky is brighter behind the trees. The moon is rising. When the moon comes, we glide out onto the ice we have claimed. It is marvelous ice, as good as any as we have known maturity in there, but the, uh, this concept of the ice and the moon and the poetic license that the author has taken to really give us some illusions uh, and similes in there is just really powerful. I got very excited. Of course, stories offer information and concepts we read for information, we read um, and are hungry to read, to learn, and to go to books for that. Children want to be smart. They want to grow. There's not one child that goes to school and says, I don't want to learn to read. Every child wants to read. Every child expects to learn to read. Every child who's been around books and heard stories and tales feels like this is a birthright. And yet, for so many children who have been stunted and don't get the zero to five enrichment, it is a hard road to hoe. It is really hard for them to play catch up at that part. Children want to wonder. They want to speculate and imagine. They want to reflect. They have an urge to be part of this greater whole, to be part of humanity. And they know that books offer a lot in that. They know, too, that stories offer episodes and incidents and activities which are very difficult for them to find words for. They offer the emotional span of being human, of being sad or lost, of feeling sibling rivalry. Those universal feelings, especially when you think you are the only one and feel 
so isolated. You read a book and you can say at the end, I am not alone, or I'm just like him, or I'm different from her, but I still like her. Enrich and stretch the imagination, and it can go either way. We can be going through a door and meeting knights and castles, or pirates and caves, or imagining ourselves on a spaceship going to visit Mars. All on journeys and adventures, and we get to go with them. For children whose life situations are dangerous or uh, stressed, books offer a way out. We hear many ch children's book authors telling us that that had it not been for the library and the books, that they wouldn't have been able to save themselves. But that that was, a, that was really something that lifted them out of their circumstances. Stories offer um, a big payoff, literary illusions. Watch out, your nose is beginning to grow. Or hurry up, I don't want to turn into a pumpkin. Or that wolf's going to get you. Or your hair is long as Rapunzel's. If you have not heard those stories, if you're not familiar with the three bears, three pigs, three little kittens, three billy goats, gruff, you name it, and all the jacks in the nursery rhymes, <laughs> uh, you can't be part of a conversation where that's being used as some kind of a literary illusion. Where's Angie here? Stories offer windows into others' lives. People whose lives look so different and to read their story and find out how similar they really are. A city kid learns about a country kid. An American learns about a Chinese kid. An able-bodied child learns about a child in a wheelchair. You have some empathy. It's a way to grow that when you read books of difference. Oh, but mirrors are those books that say, this is you. Wow, he's just like me. He's a daredevil too. And I figured I figured out why I like to do those things that he does too. Or he is afraid and I'm afraid too. There's two afraid kids in the world. Something I can't really talk about, but he turned out okay. There's possibility for these emotional stances. That stands by itself. Mama says we're going to the library, and this 11-month-old jumped up and down in her car seat and said, book, 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 book. I'm making that into just a little wrap down there in the back seat of her car. Dance in the car for joy. Many children, if you observe them, will pick out a book to be read instead of going to the Fisher Price plastic toy. It's got many more minutes of pleasure, and it's also going to be with someone who's going to stick it with you. Fisher Price toy is supposed to be standalone toy, and I can't get Mama's or Grandma's lap to sit in for that. I gather you talked about this this morning. Uh, this is about children whose lives are filled with words and talk and stories, and children's lives who are not. In the group that I work with at the Girls Club, it crosses social economic status. I have a child in there that is very wealthy. Somehow or other, her parents did not sit and be with the book with this child. She's as wiggly as they come. There's middle class kids and there are children who are from a lower social economic status. So I want to say that we don't need to say they're poor or they're wealthy. It has to do with time and investment. That is an elevator speech right there. These are children whose worlds were really diminished in the first critical part of their life when their brain cells were being you know, developed. So it's how many words that they have heard. Hart and Risley said with their 49 families that they visited, that in some families, a baby heard 1,500 words an hour from a parent who was talking and engaging with them. Now, 
are they going to walk out and say soporific? No. <laughs> <laughs> but they've got some kind of cognitive memory of big words, fancy words, little words in their brain and are able to call on it later on. It is not going to be so alien. Uh, it's the amount of language between the caretaker and the child, moment by moment, is that piece of research. The significance is the more a child hears aspects of our language, the greater the opportunity that child has to learn it. <coughs> This is quick and easy. Here's an elevator speech. If children know eight nursery rhymes by the time they're four, they're usually one of the best readers in their class when they turn eight. This comes from Men Fox out of Australia. She also says children need to hear a thousand stories before they begin school. I figured it out. Dolly's children will have a minimum of 2,000 if they only hear one book a day. And you know kids are not going to let you stop at one book a day. <laughs> Dolly understood that you need books in the home in order to love them, to read and reread and to surround yourself. I was in one home here in Sevier County and the child was making a train out of her books. And I thought at least she's handling them. She's, you know, loving on them. They're like little blocks for her, but I'm sure somebody's going to spend some time reading them at some point. Um, the librarians in this state got very nervous. Teresa, did you know that? The librarians got nervous. If they're going to have home libraries, are they not going to come to our public libraries? And the wonderful friends of the library of this state got busy and set up workshops across the state in three grand divisions and got a real collaboration between the public library and the uh, imagination library person in each county. That was a marvelous partnership. It still works today. <laughs> this is the book. <laughs> this is the book that Lauren and Sam put together for us. We get this. This is all the books that we're going to be reviewing. I mean, they can't bring all, you know, there's 22,000 books printed, published, by lots of publishers. I don't know how many Penguin puts out, but basically, They've done a pre-sort in New York and bring down, they've gotten to know this committee and their tastes pretty well. So they put them in here, in the binder. And, uh, we created a rubric, actually, and Sam made it much more visible for us because we, uh, it's complicated. We need age levels. We need developmental stages. And this is what he put together for us. I think it's online. Um, and what we're looking for. If we have any doubt, we pull out our sheet and say, well, no, that doesn't work for that age group. It'll have to be upper or it'll have to go lower. So as we're reading these out loud, we have a sense of where it's supposed to slide. As we go crazy over some of the new books that they bring down, uh, we, we have to, at the end, make a big sort and slide them into the appropriate uh, year. We want to make sure there's diverse protagonists in each of the years. We want to make sure we have not more animal characters than people or more people than animals. We try to balance that. We try to balance fiction and nonfiction, uh, poetry and narrative thoughtful and humorous, classics and new. So that is the kind of sort that we do at the very final end is where we're finding that year span. And there's, I'm just telling you that if the table is full, we have 13 or 14 titles per year down here. And then we say, which one should we lead in? Which, which one should we take out and put in a new one from 2017 publication date? So we do try to keep it refreshed, but there are some books that we just cannot pull out. Good. We read out loud because picture books are meant to be re read aloud. They're not meant to be handed to a child and to read. Beginning readers should not be handed this book because the word choice can often have a, a $5 word in it, a multi-syllable word. 
um, we leave Golden Books and Dr. Seuss for the doctor's offices. Because you will find them there. They're great. But we don't need to duplicate that effort. So we did pick one Golden Book this year, which is absolutely fine. Uh, I understand totally why Dolly Parton went with that. It's the books that we grew up with, and her generation. That's what we knew. They're also available for all, all people to get, and they're affordable. Um, we want each year's selection to be the best of the 22,000 books published for our children. We look for good language, as I've shared with you before, and we look for the best artwork. We're not looking for cute. Uh, it's a real peeve of mine to hear someone goes, that is so cute. <laughs> well, that's not going to make it for me. I want real art. I don't want to patronize children. I don't want overused images like hearts and rainbows and unicorns. They'll get those. That's in our pop culture. I want thoughtful uh, variety of art. I want to see watercolor, acrylic, oil paint. I want to see collage. I want to see black and white. I want to see silhouettes. I want to see the full range. It may be the first art or the only art that some children ever see. So it is important because these are works of art. That is how the artist and, and uh, writer have put this together. It is a major form of art. Marcia Brown, who wrote many books in the 50s and 60s and 70s, she illustrated and wrote. She said that illustration is the performance of the spirit <coughs> of the book. And some spirits are loud, and some spirits are quiet and delicate. And we want that balance as well. But we are looking for real art. If there's something new that you haven't thought about before, I hope that this might be it. I have a lot of parents say, how do I raise a brighter child? How do you get your kids to be intelligent? What do you do? I said, well, this is the most powerful activity to inspire any kind of cognitive growth. Children are listening to one story in their ears, and they're decoding the story visually from the art. They are simultaneously translating two narratives, the verbal and the visual. It is a major brain activity. The words seem to drive us forward to find out the more complete meaning, and this is where the parents are. We're reading along, but the kids are sort of trying to slow us down pictures pull us back to explore specific scenes that they're depicting. When the child is listening, and here's your words, but he's carefully looking at the pictures, and sometimes seeing a whole other picture, another whole story. A picture book reveals so much more than it actually says because of these two modes working together. work together like a dance, the visual and the text. They complement each other, they enhance, they add, they complicate. Uh, they don't merely just tell the same story. Uh, so Maurice Sendak calls it a seamless, seamless whole. Maurice Sendak, of course, changed the whole industry of the picture books because where the wild things are. And um, he says that they need to be working in concert. So right now, very quickly, we're going to try five minutes of looking at one book, and we're going to say, well, what does the text say that the pictures do not? And we're also going to say, what do the pictures say that the text does not? And we're going to see a seamless hole in The Snowy Day by Ezra Jack Keats. is open up, let me see the back of your book, since I, I don't have the paper back. Yeah. So you just look at this whole illustration. Look, a double page spread on the cover itself. What do we know about Peter just from looking at this picture on the back? Shout it out. He's walking. He's in the street. He's in a city. He's making 
contracts? Is alone? Is little. Is young. He's curious. And you can tell that from his stance. He's checking his footprints there. It's cold. It's covered up. In the paperback, you may not have what's called the end papers. You do? All right. Okay. All right. I'll tell you what. All right. The end papers often give a clue. And one of the clues that this set of end papers gives is the mode of art. It is the style of collage. Perfect for a creative child, which is what we're going to find out that Peter is. He just exudes creativity. It's made with sponge printing, cutouts, different fabrics we're going to see inside of this book, but it's already inviting us in with this allusion towards uh, the collage. <coughs> Turn the page to what's called the frontispiece, F-R-O-N-T-I-S-P-I-E-C-E, -E, frontispiece. This is often a title page, but it has the illustration, and it gives you the idea that no matter what happens in this book, the main overall mood or feeling for this book is pure joy. And how do you know this is joyful? Arms are up. Anything else? Going down at quite a cliff. See that snow flying behind them? Okay. And then we start and we say, what do the pictures tell us about Peter? He's waking up, <coughs> looking out the window, curious again, sees the snow. Okay, I know Ezra Jack Keats was a 60s guy, which is what I am, but look at that wallpaper. It's like California style, it was so cool. And the pajamas. I mean, that is one set of pajamas. So, this is a well cared for kid. He lives on the top of an apartment house. He's looking over the tops of these buildings. And he's got these cushy duvet and pillows and a cool bed. And he is just loved to death. Mama has decorated this room for him. Very just, I mean, wouldn't you like to be in this bedroom? After breakfast, he put on the snowsuit and ran outside. The snow was piled up very high along the street to make a path for walking. Again, we see his face looking kind of in awe at the snow drifts. And we love this page because in this way it does mirror the text. Crunch, 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 his feet sit, sit, sank into the snow. He walked with his toes pointing out like this, he walked with his toes pointing out like that. Is Juno still here? Yes. My grandson pointed out that even though this looked like it was the cover page, it's not. What's the difference? Different footprints. I've never seen that in all these 40 years on well, this book. <laughs> and he drags his feet slowly again, just a simple set of lines. There's nothing here that should catch a child's eye, some people would think. It is so artful, it is so shorthand, uh, but the lines say it all. Listen to this language, it was a stick. A stick that was just right for smacking a snow-covered tree. You can just hear that stick on that tree and the snow coming down. Down fell the snow, plop, on top of Peter's head. The wordless page follows that as he takes off and treks himself. He figures it's not good to be playing with those older kids, so he makes the smiling snowman, angel, pretend he's a mountain climber, and here we see that frontispiece page. And then I stop here. Look at the page with his mom. What can you tell us about the pictures that the text is not? Very caring, taking care of him. This picture of the circle is an old, iconic picture of mother and child. It comes out of the second and third century. It is brown. Let's start noticing this. It is not an accident. This means protection, careful, caring. And here he is looking up adoringly at his mother. He's been this adventurer. And now he turns into 
into a baby boy again, which is what he really is. Here he looks like a prince in an oversized tub with all his toys. And again, one of my favorite pictures is here in bed. The snowball has melted. And where is his thumb? Right in this one. This is a three-year-old, maybe a four-year-old. So he can have the world's greatest adventures, and this is what kids who are listening to this story can hear. But the pictures help reveal a much richer, three-dimensional character. And we learn at the end, of course, that he does have friends. He's not just an alone, isolated kid. And they go off into the snow again to experience more. I'm not saying that we do this with children. I'm saying this to alert ourselves, to pay more attention to the function of how the art and the text work together to make a perfect picture book. And the more you pick it up, all of these award-winning books, the more you understand that that marriage, that dance, is really very fulfilling and is a, truly a work of art. So I will leave you now to turn you over to Lauren, who is the master puppeteer in New York City, making end papers and front of pieces. Yes. Okay. usage exclusively for the Imagination Library, there's no problem at all. Um, and each title and each usage does require its own permissions form. Um, if you're doing a family fun night and you're using the cover image on a newsletter that will uh, market that event, and then at the event itself, you're going to be having someone read that book aloud to all the children, we would need a form for both the cover image and the uh, read aloud itself. And all these permissions related really forms and any other information that you may have can be received by your, your RD. Your RD can give you the permission forms, uh, the cover images themselves, so you have high res 
uh, resolution images to use so they're not grainy. Um, if you are putting on a, a theater production of one of the three titles in the program that we have Dollywood approved scripts for, they can get you those scripts. Um, and any questions that they can't directly answer, they'll bring them back to either myself or someone else at Penguin Random House and we'll get an answer for you. Um, and <coughs> we do ask that any permission requests are submitted 30 days in advance and that is because sometimes review processes can take longer depending on the request and we don't want your initiative to get held up because we're going back and forth trying to make sure that it's best for you. Uh, an example of that is maybe you've put uh, all together um, something on a website and you threw in a cover image of good night mood and you're all ready to go and you after the fact submit a request to us. Well, it's good not good night moon, it's good night gorilla that's in the program. And in fact, we don't publish good night moon, so we wouldn't even be able to give you permission. So it's just an example of why it's just you know important for us to make sure that whatever you're doing, you're good to go in terms of copyright and trademark and all of that. So there are three different forms that we have. One is for book cover images, promotional materials, whether they're physical or digital, it doesn't really matter. Um, there can be newsletters, event announcements, posters, brochures, anything that you're creating where you want to use a, a, a cover image. You would get that cover image from the uh, RFD that's assigned to your area, and um, you would just submit a request with the permission form to show that um, you're using it in the usage that is outlined in the form. Uh, at read alouds and at public events, whether you're having a fundraiser or some sort of launch event or just any, any events, um, where you're promoting the Imagination Library. Um, you know, we're not talking about having, you know, reading to your kids in your backyard or, you know, just a local library just happens to be reading a book. If it's an uh, Imagination Library event, this is when we would request a permission form. Um, and then the theater performances, like I mentioned, there are three titles that we have Dollywood approved scripts for. Uh, one is My Lucky Day, the other is One Cool Friend, and the third is The Little Engine That Could. So the book cover images and promotional material, as I mentioned before, be physical or digital. Um, the permission is pertaining to the cover image only. That is the only thing we're allowed to provide approval for. Um, so if it's the in, uh, internal spread, if it's a portion of the cover, whether it's a character or a couple of characters, it must be the full cover image that the RD provides you. Um, we just ask that the art isn't manipulated in any way because it is owned by the artists themselves. Uh, and then cover image permission does not, oh, I already said that. Yeah. All right, we can go on. <laughs> I, I said I wasn't gonna talk fast, but I know you've been here for a very long time, so I'm gonna try to go a little bit faster, but if I talk too fast, someone slow me down. Um, for read aloud events, um, as I said before, they pertain to events that are promoting the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. We ask that if whoever's reading the book, when they're sitting with the children, they just read the title and the author aloud. It's also really great for not only the kids to hear, but also parents to hear, because that may be like, wow, that was a really great book, let's go to the library or to the bookstore and find more <laughs> books by that same author or illustrator. Um, we also require that no other separate fee is charged for attendance for that read aloud. We <coughs> might have a fee for the event, because those that, that fee is being donated to the Imagination Library for fundraising, that's fine, but there's no separate fee allowed for the read aloud itself. Um, and then readings cannot be recorded, and that goes into a very, very long and arduous talk about copyright and trademark, which I think I've tried in the past to go into, and I don't even understand it, and I've <laughs> taken copyright and trademark classes. So um, basically, books are sold with different rights, including text and artwork and audio, and sometimes our company owns those rights, and sometimes we don't. And so that's why we ask that uh, you don't record anything because it could be an infringement of whoever does own the audio, whether it's um, a company that has the audiobook rights or it's a company that has the rights to make live animation. Um, that's something we can't protect against, so we just ask that we don't record anything, and that includes you know, posting a video of the whole read aloud on your Facebook page or broadcasting a live feed, which I know is pretty popular now. Um, you know, if it's a small clip, I think it's 10% is the acceptable term. So if it's just, you know, an opening scene or them just reading, you know, a page, that's fine, but not the whole book. And also, it would kind of ruin it for everybody else if, 
you will have your child watch someone online read a book versus reading the book themselves to you. Um, and then these are the three titles that we have uh, permission to approve live amateur dramatic, dramatic performances for. These are all books that are were or are still in the uh, uh, Dolly Parton, uh, Dollywood. Uh, is it called Great American Summer still, or? Um, no. Okay, it's not called that anymore. Um, but basically it's ones that have been in the program before, and so we have the approved scripts for, um, they can't be manipulated in any way. In fact, they were written by and approved by Dollywood themselves. Um, but like I said, if you do have a, a, a theater, an amateur theater company putting on those performances, uh, and again, they do have to be non-fee, um, I'm sorry, they can be fees if they're for fundraising. Uh, and then uh, your permission form will get approved, and the script will be provided to you by your radio, or by Dollywood, whoever you're speaking with. Um, and so I hope that was really quick, and I hope that uh, uh, was enough information. But of course, if you have any questions for either myself or for Jinx, please feel free to ask. Event and it's not PPI, I mean, not our own organizational you know, organization that's doing that. Say it's at the county fair, and we, we, we're in the little log cabin there, and we want to read stories from the Imagination Library. So we have to get permission <coughs> for each book that we're going to read at that event. We don't charge, it's just, yeah, it's not even advertised, it's just if children walk in. Yeah, we ask this. You know, if you're if you are mentioning that it's part of the Imagination Library, we would need a permission form. Just to like as the example I before, as long as the title is part of the program, right. program mm -hmm. it's just more just to make sure that it is because there's so many there's so many books and there are books in a whole series. So it could be a certain Ladybug Girl book that was in the program, mm -hmm. but then there are plenty of other Ladybug Girl books that haven't been in the program. So it would be a little bit misleading to say that that book was. And so that's mostly why we. That. So once we've received the permission, is it then not permissible to take a picture of that and put it on our Facebook? Oh no, page? that's fine. You can still put the yeah. If, if uh, photos are fine of them of the, of the reading event, that's completely fine. Uh, it'd be okay. great if you could mention in there, um, so and so is reading this title by so okay. and so. That would be great. Uh, but as, as long as it's not a video recording of Correct. a full reading, that's when um, that would be. Okay, wonderful, thanks. Hi, I'm wondering if there is a fee attached to acquiring the proof scripts. There is no fee for those, for those specific ones. Any questions for Jinx about book um, selection? Hi. What's the, the difference between the books chosen for those last, the last two age groups, you know, the two oldest age groups? What's the differentiation factors there for choosing those books? You got my cheat sheet. You know, we're starting to think of these children as um, very conscious and getting ready for school or, you know, being in groups and um, having an interest in the outside world, more like science, curious about how things work. Um, we talk about more complex stories. They understand this idea of a hero, um, whereas, you know, the little ones, one or two, may not exactly. So we're looking at... Uh, we even said we had a manners book in each one of these years. I don't know if we kept that most recently. Oh, is that what you're asking about? I mean, we're talking about different content. Um, aren't they both four-year-old groups? There's a four-year-old and about to turn five. Yes. Isn't that correct? Yeah. Turning four and turning five. Turning four. So particularly the turning five. See which exactly is that certain months age group? That's the same the question. It's based, there's this chart. <laughs> it's, based on the, it's based on the birth year. So 
So any child that's turning five in 2017, uh, you know, graduates out the month of their of their birth, uh, the month of their birthday. But uh, if they're turning five in the year, they're in that age group. So that those things and concepts for group six, which. Um, did you read those bullets off for group six? Okay, group six, school preparation and readiness. Using rebuses, like pictures used for words. Science, more nonfiction. Folk tales, I'm going to do the last infusion of sort of the classic folk tales. Thank you and appreciation books, rhymes and poetry. So we're really more, I mean, this is school readiness. We're trying to get kids prepped, I think. Yeah, so each age group has those themes and concepts that they take into consideration when they're actually doing the, the selection or slotting uh, or reviewing the books. It's, it's, it's not a science. We were talking about this before. It's, it's, uh, we deal with what books are available that year. Uh, we deal with what's so good in the lineup that we can't bear to pull a book out. So, you know, each, each year we are just um, stymied by the high quality of the books and so what to do. A certain percentage do change every year. It's around 25, uh, 30%. Yeah, and some, some of the countries, like in the UK, the, the turnover is a higher percentage. Um, There's a much, much smaller number of kids in the UK, so we don't have a lot of excess inventory uh, in those countries. We use more trade versions, because we don't have the numbers to, to uh, produce the custom editions that we do in the US because every title in the U.S. Uh, program is made specifically for the Imagination Library. Oh dear. Oh dear. <laughs> there really is no provision for different books for twins. <laughs> no, it's all based on the birth year. <laughs> Yeah, it does have their name on it. <laughs> it's the only time they get their own personal collection of books. Yeah. Right, any other questions? Lauren, um, this is a. Um, my children received the books. They both graduated from the program now, and. Well, most of the books we keep because I'm a bookkeeper and we like the books. Sometimes we would like to give the books to someone else, maybe a doctor's office or a pediatrician's office or a little free library. Have you ever tried to peel one of those stickers? <laughs> 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 I've never seen some of those stickers. You don't like those stickers on the book. <laughs> so the, in the beginning, the, the reason that those were um, on directly on the book, for one, we have a lot of community partners who are recognized on those labels. Um, so they wanted that recognition within the community and to stay with the book. It also has the child's name on it, and it's their ownership of the book. Uh, however, in the last uh, two years, we transitioned over. We actually absorbed that cost uh, to transition over to a removable, a more removable label. Um, it is, very. it is Not better. Very. <laughs> However, it does, uh, you know, the, the finish of the book has a lot to do with how removable it is. So a shiny book like The Snowy Day, you can peel that label off a lot easier. Uh, last off on Market Street is more of a luster uh, matte finish on it, so it may not peel off as well. Uh, heat also, uh, if it's in the mailbox, you take it out and you'll pull a sticker right off. So the adhesive um, and the finish of the book has a lot to do with the removal. Goo Gone. Goo Gone works great. Yeah, Goo Gone does work. Yeah. But there has, yeah, people, some people use Sharpies. We also have labels that, um, that we've done to cover up that. Labels to slap it on there. Uh, we use those in our office a lot. Um, you know, compliments of, and, you know, they can be given out to other children or other organizations. I like the community. We want to mark out the names. People, kids are exposed to that this is an imagination library book. So, and if I give it to Dr. Dawkins or whatever, they can see that. Right, any other questions? Before I forget, you can take those copies of Snowy Day with you. Thank you.
Uh, I was wondering about the uh, merger between Penguin and Random House, how that impacted the book selection process and the um, body of books that would be available now for the program, because I'm assuming it's greatly increased the potential titles that could be included. Great question. Uh, it has certainly increased, which makes um, pairing down uh, much, much trickier. We, we have a lot of wonderful books um, between both our and Penguin, Young Readers, and Random House Open Books are still very much separate divisions, but we recognize that there are still wonderful books in Random House Children's Books, and we have brought many of them over. Um, we have um, five in the program this, this current year. Um, that may grow next year um, based on the selections that we've done, um, uh, that the committee has done. Um, so it has grown, but as as James was mentioning before, there are a lot of books that children already get. So it's books like Seuss and um, and Eastman. A lot of children have access to that through a lot of other programs. Um, and then there are a lot of great books in Random House children's books that um, are not really part of the the core of Imagination Library, such as things that are really popular on TV. So we do a lot of licenses, um, a lot of Disney, a lot of you know Pixar and, and, and properties like that, which children can access that at any time. You know, they really, the committee really feels strongly, and I think the foundation feels strongly about getting really great quality books, uh, picture books from classics to new and up and coming authors and illustrators. Um, and, and we try not to view where they are published from. You know, if we have access to them and we're able to offer them, we want to make sure that the committee can review them and, and select them based on their own merits, not, not based on who published them. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Great job. Yeah. 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 I'll also add, the merger with Penguin and has also helped us um, with our strategic growth. Um, in Penguin, before the merger, didn't have a lot of books published into the Canadian market, for instance. Mm -hmm. With the merger of Random House and Penguin, that opened up the catalog to have more culturally relevant books, our Canadian authors, illustrators. So we're actually, um, in 2018, there's going to be 28 titles that were either published uh, by Penguin Random House Canada or have Canadian authors or illustrators. Um, the same um, in the UK, uh, there's some specific imprints for like, diversity um, that came over from the Random House merger. Um, it's still in progress though, actually. Um, the warehousing uh, in the US has been merged over, the cells have been merged over, but in the UK, uh, as of next month, their warehousing is merging. So there's parts of it that are still happening, but we've been, we've seen some positive effects with the available titles um, in each of the countries. How are you choosing? How are you choosing the bilingual titles? Are those? I know, like there are some that are translated specifically from old editions, and some of them are newer books. How are you choosing which ones are bilingual editions? So, uh, once in a while, a title already is is bilingual, and if the title is itself selected just based on its own merits that's included in the program, other times we look at the list of what's been selected, and then we go into, do we have the Spanish language rights to that particular title, and if so, is there enough space in that book to offer a bilingual option? And we actually work with a translator who provides the, the Spanish language text, um, both Sam and Tim Jinx actually look over the bilingual text that we've created and um, approve it. Um, it gets a little bit trickier as we get to the older ages, because it's more text heavy, um, and sometimes just, it just, just doesn't merit, uh, it just isn't, isn't enough room. But we do our best to select the titles that would be content-wise really great for bilingual or just spatially we, we, we can fit it in there. Um, I think we have about two for age group um, right now, potentially going to do for a couple of age groups. I think they're great. Any other questions? Which Golden Book title is coming out now? Home for a uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just got the samples in the office uh, yesterday. Actually, I got brought over here with some other boxes, and I was like, oh, I need those at the office. So, so yeah, it'll be going out in uh, August. August. Uh, well, it's August title, yeah. It's shipping, it's shipping next month, and then it'll get ch shipped to the children in August. I want, to, I want to take just a quick second while Lauren is up here and brag on Penguin Random House for a second. 
Um, Janelle Jamerson in one of the earlier sessions mentioned scale. One of the tricks to the imagination library is keeping the quality extremely high while keeping the, crop, the cost uh, extremely low. And one of the hallmarks of a great partner is someone who not only works with you um, to their interest, but really to your interest, right? Penguin Random House, since, uh, gosh, what are we having, a decade now? Yeah, more than over a decade, has worked with us tirelessly to figure out how we deliver this program at extremely high quality and extremely low cost. So um, I wanted to just say, tell, tell Lauren and Lisa, of course, how much we appreciate them. They wrestle with us every year trying to figure out how we squeeze pennies out. Um, because, you know, in a million books in a run, pennies make a big, big difference. And so we really appreciate them. As well as, I wanted to brag on Sam, uh, this operations gig is not easy. Uh, sometimes it feels like we're in the shipping business. Um, but they do a fabulous job. They make a great team together. And of course, uh, Jinx is really, we look to as one of our main, or really the leader of the book selection process. It's a great small group of people. But I could listen to you talk all day. Oh. <laughs> I'm sitting over here falling in love all over again. <laughs> yeah. I feel so passionate about this topic. Yeah. Honestly, so thank you so much, Jane. She volunteers her time every year. I think they really enjoy it. I hope you guys really enjoy it. But you do such a fabulous job. I was going to add to this piece about Penguin. When we first started and um, David Dotson brought down publishers, representatives from five major publishing companies. Many of these people just sort of went, uh-huh, yeah, all right, okay, well, yeah, we've got book giveaway programs all the time. Yeah, I guess we could have one more. They were so blasé. We were so offended. I mean, we had this dream of this program just expanding and just being so important. And Penguin came along, and Lisa uh, just said, I get it, I get this. And she was so enthusiastic and so passionate. And Lauren's got the same energy and that same passion for it. So it's just, I mean, I, I can't even imagine working with any other publisher. So I want to put that PS in. It's not like we just sort of randomly dialed up Penguin and picked them. It really was a, uh, a juried effort to look at five major publishing. And people were just, they didn't get it. So that's it. That's it.